Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. Today's webinar will be about how to draw realistic faces on Cliff Studio Paint, presented by Ergo Josh. Before we begin the webinar, there are some housekeeping items that I would like to go through. The webinar will be approximately one hour long. All attendees will be muted. Questions and answer session will be during the last 15 minutes of the webinar. Attendees can ask questions in the GoToWebinar question box right away. Due to time constraints, not all questions will be answered. The webinar will be recorded. Recording will be shared on social media and will be sent via email to all registrants and attendees. The panelists for the webinar are Rahim Nies, Joanna Brower, Mario Quinones, myself, and Ergo Josh. For those of you who are joining us for the very first time and have never heard about Clip Studio Paint, Clip Studio Paint is your all-in-one solution for stunning, ready-to-publish illustrations, comics, manga, and animation. Learn more at clipstudio.net forward slash and graphicsly.com. And with that, we'd like to pass the reins of the webinar over to Ergo Josh who will begin his presentation, how to draw realistic faces in Clip Studio Paint. Thanks so much. All right, hey everyone, uh, I'm Ergo Josh, and I just wanted to show you really quick. Um, so I'm a digital artist on YouTube and Instagram. Uh, you probably heard about me from my YouTube channel. Um, I usually do portraits. You can see how I started here on my Instagram. Um, starting off just traditional pencil and paper and then working my way up to doing some more characters lately. So the goal with this uh, webinar is I wanted to show you uh, what I've learned um, in the past of all of my sketches and all of my drawings and kind of help you see how I see when I'm going through my work. So uh, a few examples of my artwork, I just wanna go through some of them. You can see this portrait here. Um, I really like to do work with portraits because I love faces and I, I feel like it's the most important part of a character. Um, you can see another one here I did. Uh, this one I started in Procreate and you can see my workflow. I usually like to work with a sketch. This usually started off with a reference. Then I go in and add some line work because I love drawing most of all. Um, then I go into shading, talk about my shading techniques here, and then I go into color. And uh, if we look at another piece here that I did, this is me getting more into bodies um, now that I've, I'm working in a Cintiq on my Wacom. Um, I'm getting into a lot more details. It's a lot easier for me to, to go through and start learning how to apply what I've learned to an entire body. And now that I'm working in Clip Studio Paint, I've really, really, really love um, all the tools. I don't really have to mess with all of the uh, brushes and things so much, and I can just get into working um, the way I want to and uh, create the characters that I want to. And you can see some of my more recent pieces here. This is still very much a work in progress, but you can see I'm applying again a lot of those things that you saw in my earlier Procreate artwork here in Clip Studio Paint and getting into drawing some other things like these are the first fishes that I've seriously drawn and then something very recently that I'm working on still um, another sketch in Clip Studio and uh, we're going to start talking about how I go about the heads and all of these shapes um, in this webinar. So to kick it off I wanted to show you guys this diagram and this is basically how I'm thinking when I'm working um, and when I'm looking at a reference for when I want to draw. It's really this head shape that's really key to everything that I do and recognizing this shape and within a lot of things actually, it's not just for the heads. I really want to pay attention to the shape and I really want to be able to understand it uh, fundamentally so that I can move it around and be free because I find that when it comes to looking at a reference like this, it's easy to get confused with what you're looking at and you know you do want to draw what you see but sometimes you can replace with what you see with what you think you know and so i want to tell you about how i have learned to know better and then combine that with drawing what i see um, so the first step is really going to be looking at how to start off the head uh, in a diagram so for example this is how i always start you know starting off with a circle but you know it sounds like that's how everything is done but it really is a great way to start off with the head because it really breaks it down 
um, into a form that's easy to understand. The head is, for me at least, it's much easier to understand as a sphere. And um, once I do that, I like to draw a line going down. So you can imagine a sphere and then a card slicing through it. And then that card is going to create a line through it like that. And so that's what I have set up here. You want to draw that line down to the center of the circle here, and then you want to draw a ellipse, um, depending on, of course, where the character is facing. But you want to bisect that sphere in half with an ellipse. And if they're looking down, you want to pay attention and make sure that the front of that ellipse is here. And then if we were to make this the front of the ellipse, then the character would actually be looking up. And so if I go into detail a little bit more here, what I can go ahead and do is draw a line like this and then like that. And so you can see there's this kind of platform here where uh, you can get a much clearer idea for how that plane is sitting within the head. And so one thing that I've learned and I really want you guys to pay attention to is that when you draw the rest of the face, you don't just keep continuing and doing something like this. What actually happens with the head is that the face rests on a plane that just goes straight down. So when you draw this coming down, you want to imagine a sheet of paper that's just falling right down. And uh, it's going to help you a lot when you study perspective to be able to draw heads as well. But imagine the sheet of paper that's just going straight down on the face. And the face is going to reside on that sheet of paper. And so going from there, when the head is constructed like a sphere, like I said, but it's not a perfect sphere, you actually want to cut it. And so I'll show you a little bit later with a diagram how exactly that relates to the actual anatomy of the head. Um, but when it comes to getting the chin and the whole size of the head down, it's kind of tricky. You kind of just have to guess, but you can refine that later and you're going to get better and better at uh, figuring that out as you go. Um, and then another basic shape I like to add to things is adding the neck, of course, and then a little bit of the shoulders. But here, a really key part to this. So when I said that you want to draw a line straight down coming from the ellipse that forms the head, you also want to think about the keystone. Now, the keystone is a very major part of the head, and I'm going to show you here in this diagram. The keystone is right here, and so that's going to be the space in between your eye sockets, and that keystone shape is going to be fairly large for women and then very small for men, just uh, as a trend. Um, so for here, this example is a female, and so we're going to have a very large keystone here, and then to the next, to the sides of it, you're going to want to draw two lines down here. And so these are going to ideally line up with the iris, and they're going to line up with the corner of the mouth as well. And so from there, I'm going to go ahead and skip into the proportions. So when we're looking at proportions, we want to take that line that we talked about here, and then the chin line here, and then we want to divide that this head in half. So I did a really, really quick sketch of what I the diagram I just showed you here just drew the sphere it doesn't have to be perfect um, you don't have to get the the ellipse tool out every time but as you get more and more confident with this this will look cleaner and cleaner as you move on and so you can see I have my keystone here the keystone bends backwards away from that center line that goes straight down again remember don't try not to draw faces that curve like that and place your features there because that's not really how the head works it comes down the forehead and then straight down is where you want to start placing your features. Um, and so when we have this space, we have this. This is going to be about a one half like that. And then when we bisect it again, we're going to want to do a half here. And this is going to be about where your eyeballs are going to land and sit on top of. And so this is going to be about another fourth like that. And then if we go down this right here, you want to actually divide this instead of in half you want to divide this into about uh let's say a third so if we do that and you imagine the lines going down this way and so when we divide this into a third this is going to be your mouth line and then this is going to be the top of your chin and so with that, you pretty much have your face set up. Um, depending on the person here, you can also add another half line here, and this is going to be where the keystone stops. Um, and also, to keep in mind, when we are talking about depending on the person, these measurements can tend to change a little bit depending on their likeness, um, but that will be up to you to kind of decide. Um, another thing about the ear is going to rest right here in the middle of that circle where we cut 
the shape of the head in and the ear the top of the ear is usually going to line up with this uh, curve right here and then the ear will actually connect to the head a little bit lower than that line and then it will connect at the bottom a little bit lower than the jaw line and so if i go ahead and show you a little bit of that anatomy here you can see how everything works so we have this half line it's bisecting here the face where the cheekbones are going to land and then your eyeballs are going to kind of rest in this space right here so if we pull up our little trusty skull image right here you can see how this works um, you can imagine where the eye socket where the eyes would sit inside of that socket you can see this is the same structure that i'm talking about here and if we look at the skull again and zoom out a little bit we can see this thing right here is called the dental sphere and that's going to be where your mouth where your jaw kind of protrudes in order to have your teeth and everything work properly so what i do here is i draw a line right under the nose and i draw a line like this that protrudes just slightly from that center line and then that will come down and meet with the chin line that we just drew and i, I don't think i mentioned it yet but again when we divide the head in half from the brow line and the chin this is going to be where your nose actually connects and so that line is where your nose is going to be but the little detail here is you're going to have this part of your nose that kind of curls up and then comes out that's going to be where that line is and the wings of your nose or your nostrils are really going to kind of hang up above that or below that depending on the person um, but remember the base of your nose you really want to think about it being a little bit higher than you would think because that's where that little curved part is going to come back out at um, and then looking at the teeth again just kind of imagine them slightly coming out along with this entire dental sphere here um, don't make it too much because you're going to make your character look very primal um, but again that could be intentional uh, you never know depends on what you're drawing or what type of character you're trying to design um, but keeping these measurements in mind and knowing why they're there um, like the keystone being smaller for men um, if you really want a masculine character or a masculine person to come across you really want to make that very close together and small and then if you want someone to look very feminine you want to make this bigger wider and taller like that and you can see how the eye sockets work here they just kind of wrap around in this kind of a uh, oval shape and if you look at the skull reference again you can see where i'm getting that from here you may notice that this is kind of stylized and that's just how i find it uh how i naturally draw people but i find you know the some of the best stylized work is always going to be heavily based off of knowledge of the reality you know looking at a skull looking at how the face is constructed looking at how the head is constructed is really going to help you going forward so with this i want to get into a little bit of the features um, just to quickly place them here we uh, after you draw the keystone you're going to want to drop a curved ribbon like this down and then that's going to kind of intersect with the sphere here i'm going to draw a line like that and so that's going to be a little bit of the top of the nose here and then there's going to be a line that comes back down and then the wink of the nose will be on the right and then the nose will be here the eyes you're going to want to think about the eyelids wrapping around the sphere remember to think in 3d this is a sphere not just a circle so the eyes the eyelids are going to wrap around it like that and curve around there and you're going to have the uh the tear duct in the corner of the eye sit there and here sometimes it's going to be visible and sometimes it won't be depending on the angle of the head and that's going to wrap around like this and then your eyebrows depending on the person and their expression they're going to rest just below the brow line sometimes it can be above it but they're going to reside around that brow line and they're going to follow the contour of this bone here and the same is going to be with this side but they're not going to go beyond the keystone that keystone area is going to be just um, just your skin there and with your mouth like the lines we drew in the beginning they're going to the corners of the mouth are going to be here like this they're going to try to line up there and try to think of it in perspective again you're not going to draw the mouth like that facing this way when the character is facing that way you want to again think okay we have a straight line here the mouth connects here but it's going to come back out in this graceful movement like that um, to meet up with the the dental sphere protrusion here and then you draw it back out like this where it would kind of tuck back into the surface of the skin like that so to get into a little bit more detail than just that 
I have a little diagram here that I'm going to get into. So you can see here how these uh, features are placed. And so I kind of like to think of the head as just five simple features. Um, you have the eyebrows, then the eyes. Let me actually get on this layer. Then the nose, then the mouth, and then the ear. The ear we're not going to pay too much attention to because it's always hidden by hair. And sometimes, like uh, one of my professors has said that, you know, you can get everything right on the face and but if you get the ear wrong no one's going to notice that the ear doesn't look like the person you were trying to draw um, but when it comes to the eyes this is a really key point for me um, you want to think of them as a 3d object that's kind of like a folded sheet of paper so there's going to be three planes three main planes that you want to think of so this is going to be the middle plane which is going to be usually where your iris is going to be and that's going to be where your character is looking and so that can kind of change um, in this case, she's going to be looking this way, so it's kind of halfway in that area, but you want to think of the eye as following that shape. That's really the key part of this. I'm trying to break down the shape into this angular form that so you can understand how it's curving around, and this can change depending on where the character is looking. So these lines could be like this if the character is looking this way. Um, so just keep that in mind. And when it comes to the nose, I like to do a triangle shape here. And so this shape can be abstracted in a lot of different ways. Um, I'm inspired by a lot of uh, Disney's work and um, uh, let's see, Loish and Gabrielle Bricky, if you know those two artists, uh, they have really been helpful in helping me uh, understand how to break down my faces. But I like to break it down a little bit more than that. So instead of just doing a triangle like this, I add an extra side here and here to represent the beginning of the curve of the um, wing of the nose. And then I draw a circle here to represent the top of it here. So that's the top that usually catches the most light. You're gonna have a highlight here. Sometimes you have highlights like this. Sometimes you have a highlight on the corner like that. And then sometimes the person will have a very angular nose and it will actually be a square like this that will come forward like that, and you'll have a highlight here. Um, this area also sometimes has a highlight because it's very round. But I just like to simplify this again and then come down and meet the top of the curve here with the sides of the wings like that. And then usually this curve of the nose will be visible only at an angle, and that will connect with the eyebrow. Um, if the person is looking head on, you're not really going to see that curve nearly as um, as uh, sharp unless the person is uh, has a very masculine um, very uh, sculpted nose and those noses tend to have um, a shape like this where they kind of come out in the center before they come and meet the tip of the nose and moving down to the lips this is personally my favorite part of the face to draw um, a big part of making the lips look realistic is understanding that they kind of fold in and out from the face. So a diagram that I always like to draw is if you can imagine a strip of paper sitting down and you wanted to turn them into lips, you want to pull this upwards like that while tying down the corners of this uh, strip of paper here. And so if I were to do that here, it would look like this. And then I would draw the strip in the back. And then I would add this kind of shape here, the little divot at the top of the lips, and then bring this down. And then this will come out and then join back here like that. And then a key part is where it comes back to meet the rest of the skin, there's going to be a dimple there. And that area is usually very dark because it's very difficult for light to get in. And uh, this curve will come down here, being the tip of the, the lip like that. And then, of course, you're going to have the rest of the lip come down. And so that's how this is working here. A lot of times, I'll also add a little bit of a shadow here when I'm sketching, um, because that can be an area when it comes back inwards like that, where light can find it difficult to get into again. Um, but I like to just simplify the lips into the shape, um, and it makes it really easy to understand. And when it comes to the eyebrows, I just like to think of it as two shapes again. Um, I like to use a lot of triangles in my work to help me understand the form. They're going to rest somewhere along this brow line. Um, usually it's going to be pretty accurately just right on that line, but I'm referencing the image fairly heavily this time just to make things clear. Um, but again, when you're drawing your characters, 
it's going to be pretty easy for you to uh, keep everything straight and along with the line without having to worry too much about how um, the you know how accurate it is to the image i want you to be able to draw have things look realistic have things actually match the character but it doesn't always have to be that way and a lot of times that can help you avoid mistakes um, so you might be wondering you know okay if i do that how do i make sure that the character looks good and so that's when i'm going to get into aesthetics and so that's in this case what i like to do is if i show you that layer below i like to simplify the image a little bit further um, and break it down into even more basic shapes that I can use when I like to flip my image just to make sure the proportions of the sizes of everything are looking really good. So if I hide this layer again, um, the features, and I show you the aesthetics, I just broke down everything into very, very basic triangles. Um, this is just what I like to use. You'll, you've, if you watch me on YouTube, this is one of my uh, most popular videos is how I just break this down into just a very simple shape, like for the mouth, it's just a triangle and then a trapezoid. For the nose, it's just two triangles like this. And then for the eyes, I break them down even simpler into just two triangles like that. And so the line in the middle is usually going to represent where the uh, part of the eye that bulges out the most is going to be. Um, and as you draw more and more, you're going to find that it's a lot easier for you to visualize this more and more. Um, and then I just have the ear here along this line. Um, this line, usually, if you're drawing very constructed, is going to go straight down, but the jawline in both men and women is going to come in quite a bit. Um, for men, it's going to come in less, um, but there are some women, like the one in the reference I'm using, who have fairly square jaws as well. So keep that in mind. Always pay attention to the reference and whatever personality you want your character to have. Um, but to encourage you, if you're finding it difficult, um, to visualize this kind of stuff because it can be challenging. For example, a big problem that I, I personally have and I see a lot is it's very easy to just make the nose and the lips too big. And so something like this, you may not think that this looks too bad at all, but once you get into the details and the rendering, it can really, really have a huge impact. Um, and so being able to recognize the flow of the proportions, making sure um, that the nose is in a crazy proportion compared to the eyes is really key. Um, and even here, I recommend that you look at a lot of artists that you enjoy because they're going to be able to help you understand how you can push and pull different proportions in order to keep things looking um, aesthetic. And so one thing that I like to do is I'm gonna try to show you an example of how you can push this to like Disney proportions here. So I'm gonna try and draw a typical Disney kind of, a, I think it's popularly referred to as like the cookie cutter face. And so I'm gonna take the basic forms that I see in a lot of Disney um, characters here, and then their eyes will be larger. And so how they offset that is the eyebrows are going to be very, very thin usually, and much higher up on the head like this. And then the nose will tend to shrink as well. So when you when you pull and push things to different sizes, you want to make sure you pay attention to the rest. Um, and then usually the mouth will shrink as well. But it, again, this depends if you want to go more of a Disney style. This could also depend on ethnicity as well. But as you can see here, it still has the has a good enough flow to where it would make sense um, as that type of character. And all of this comes from the same place. Again, this is all coming from looking at realism and reality. And so I'm gonna prove that to you by showing you a few examples of those same images that we use in the beginning and the head shapes, but I'm actually gonna go into detail and show you how it's broken up. And so this is how I'm gonna to try to explain flow to you. Um, when we're looking at a head, it's really important to understand that all of this is like expertly, perfectly designed and everything flows into one another. And so these shapes right here are all flowing and they all have volume to them. And um, the darker areas are gonna be where there are gonna be very tight creases in the form and the 
lighter lines are just going to be slight form lines that you see along the face. And so you can see them here at a very extreme angle with a masculine figure. You can see the roundness of that nostril there and how the nose wraps around and how the face wraps around these sides. And so when you begin to understand these things, and you combine it with lighting. Your drawings are and paintings are never going to look the same again. You're always going to know that no matter what I do, this has to look, has to be shown in my drawing and my rendering. If you're trying to draw a realistic face, you have to have this convey in your shading. Um, if it doesn't come through, you have to make sure and try and draw this diagram over what you've done so that you can really make sure that the person can understand um, what you're trying to show because having a face that has features and it's very flat can be very unappealing um, depending on the style of course so i wanted to show you guys a few examples of how to um, really pay attention to that so here you can see in this face right here there's absolutely no shading whatsoever but the contours of the lines are so accurate that you can get a very clear sense of how the form of the face is moving. Even within the eyelids, there's form. You can see how the eyelid is wrapping around the eyeball and then there's a surface underneath it. And if we look at this one, you can look at even within a stylized character like this and an animation software has flow to it and all of the forms radiate out and connect with each other like this. Um, this these shapes are broken up in a combination of actual real anatomy, you actually do have muscles around your eye that work like this. You actually do have a muscle around your mouth that kind of pulls and pushes like that. But again, this is also subdivided for you know animation purposes. But this is again, another example of how flow should work and how the relationship of the proportions should feed well into each other. And if we look at a realistic example, it's the same thing. Um, this is a very realistic version of the face, but again, all of the lines flow together. Um, and if you're if you're paying close attention, you'll notice there's kind of star points like this that represent um, stark transitions of form that have been subdivided. So if we look at this image here, you can see this is a lower poly version where there's clear cuts of where the form starts to change. But sometimes um, when we look at a photograph, it's hard for us to actually understand how that's working. So. In order for you to kind of practice that, I have a couple of materials that I would recommend that you go to. You can check out William Wynn on uh, ArtStation. He has this great example of a diagram of the, I'm not sure what this head is called again. There's a name for this type of head, but he has this lighting source where you can easily check out your lighting and reference how it's working and make sure that your head, if you're trying to do realism, has these plain old changes within the head. So you know that this is going to catch light first before this side does because it's pointed closer to the source of light if the light is over here. I also recommend that you go to um, Murray's page on Cute Brush. He has two free materials. He has a reference of a Riley diagram for the head. I really recommend this because it's it's a great way to train yourself to see um, what you're not seeing. This may look confusing, but as you learn the face more and more, you'll be able to quickly spot out what lines on the other side of the face are what. You can download this or just rotate this if you want, depending on if you're drawing, um, and you just need a quick reference for how the flow should work. This is free as well. I really recommend it. He also has an incredible PDF of how lighting works. Um, this is free. Um, and you can look at this and this applies the you know the typical round sphere ball approach to drawing and it applies it to so many different types of forms and that's really really going to be you know critical in helping you understand how all of this stuff works and so if i go back here we're going to go into the last part of this webinar where i just go into a sketch i've already prepared and i'm going to show you how i approach rendering um, in a very kind of systematic way um, I've naturally been very uh, detail-oriented and very technical-minded, um, so I went to architecture school <laughs> instead of art school, and this has just been a great way for me to understand things. Um, and uh, hopefully as I do this, I'll be able to answer some questions, but first I want to talk about um, how I set this up. So after I have a sketch, after I'm proud of it, after I flipped it back and forth several times, what I'll do is I'll go ahead and pick a light gray for the background like this. And so that's going to help me understand the values. Um, you always want to start like this because it helps you uh, 
First off, it just helps you not get tired when you're drawing for long periods of times. Um, it's really easy on the eyes to work with a gray canvas like this. And then it also helps you get an understanding for, for how your drawing is going to, or how your values are going to work. So what I like to do is I like to separate the drawing into two layers. So I'll have a new layer here and I'll actually name that, go ahead and name that shadow. And then I'll do another layer and name that light. And so those represent layers where I will literally paint in the shadow and the light. And I like to start off with grayscale again because my favorite thing is drawing. And then after that, my favorite thing is rendering and showing values and forms. And so my technique is what I actually like to do is I start off with, I like to use this lighter pencil brush. Um, I use a very similar brush when I'm working in any other program like Procreate because not only do I just like this kind of like concept art, soft sketching aesthetic, but it's really easy to take line work in a sketch and bring it into your rendering without having to worry about getting rid of lines. It's so easy to melt this into itself. And when you're working with light and shadow as well, I am pretty lazy. Um, <laughs> I just like to work with black and or very dark gray and white, and I don't really pick too many different values. I don't really want to concern myself with that. I let the pressure sensitivity of my tablet and my Wacom pencil um, give me different values. So what I like to do is I like to pick a very relatively dark color. Actually, for this one, what I'll do is I'll pick something in between, like a 70%. And I'll just go ahead and start painting in the shadows. And then eventually I'll come back with a much darker um, color and then paint in the darkest shadows. And I'll repeat the same with the lights. Um, there's two techniques for a rendering that I have. A lot of times I will just render the biggest shadows first. And so, for example, with that, I'll just increase my brush size and then just start painting in really dark shadows for the hair. But there's another technique where I just like to render the features first, and then once those are good, I'll just render whatever I feel is necessary for the face so that I don't get overwhelmed and overdo the face rendering because that's a that's a really easy thing to do. A lot of people are actually so afraid of it, they never use a full range of values. Um, and so today I'm gonna show you that secondary technique because I think, I think it's a lot easier um, to grasp. And so I'm just gonna erase some of the stuff that I started out with. And you're going to see after we finish just the shadows how how much this starts to read well um, without even getting into the lighting. And so what I like to do first is I don't pay too much attention to the reference again because my goal is always just trying to use the reference as a reference and not um, a photo study unless I'm intentionally doing that. I'm just going to add a little bit of shadow to the eyebrows just to give them some color like I did with the hair. And then I'm going to go ahead and render a light tone for the eyes. Um, you always want to be thinking, you know, how can I apply the basic assignment um, of, you know, taking the sphere ball that you've had to draw in class, in art class, even in a public school with the shadow, and then you have the core shadow and the reflected light, and then the highlight, and then the main light source. I don't even know all the names by now, but you want to take that assignment and it applies to everything when you're rendering. Um, again, I reference that that uh, I recommend this this book right here for free to download to really if you read all of that and really do all of the exercises in there, you're going to be set for sure. Um, so I'm going to start adding some shadow here because I'm aware that the eyelid is going to be casting some shadow um, above the eyeball itself here. And then I'm going to be adding some shadow to the middle here. I'm glad we have plenty of time to get into this, so I should be able to have a pretty decent result by the end of it. Um, now, when I'm thinking about the light source, I'm thinking of just a general light source that's coming down. Um, if you were imagining a pencil uh, in the direction of the light or an arrow, it would be like this, but more towards the coming out of the paper. And so I'm aware of that and I'm thinking, okay, this surface of the eyelid is going to get a lot more light than this one. So I'm going to add some shadow here. Also, one thing to mention is depending on how you like to paint, it may make more sense for you to paint in the light first because that's how things actually work in reality. Light is 
hitting places and not hitting places. So it does make more sense to paint in the light because that's what's actually, you know, existing. Darkness is everywhere and the light is what's illuminating the form. And I'm going to add a little bit of shadow here, but not too much to this side because I'm aware that the light is coming from that direction. Add a lot more here just to make that form come out. And I'm hoping you can start to see what I was talking about when I'm using those soft lines. It's really, really easy to transition them into the form. I'm going to switch to the blending tool, which is one of the my favorite features of Clip Studio, this, this amazing blending tool. And I love doing this instead of, I'm actually going to go to the sketch layer. I love doing this instead of erasing. It just feels more engaging, more like I'm working with a real, you know, canvas and uh, more intimate with the artwork. And I feel like having more, having stuff that still exists somewhere in the painting helps your painting feel more alive at the end. So I'm going to erase some of my, or blend away some of my guidelines here. And if you want, you can keep, you know, draw in more shading guidelines just to help you. Um, but I recommend that you do those sparingly because you don't want to be too constrained uh, according to the reference. So I'm going to go back to my shadow layer. Still, again, we're only doing shadows. I'll go back to my airbrush. Um, some people don't like using airbrushes, but I recommend them. Uh, well, I use them just for my style. And again, I find it very easy for me to understand just adding light and shadow um, in order to create a form. So again, what I'm doing here is I'm adding shadow here. I'm aware, I'm thinking about this part, remember, um, about the flow. Uh, so if you remember here, seeing how that form comes around and then kinds of actually starts to create a puffy shape, but sometimes it can go inwards here. Um, again, here, this is puffy, but then that's like concave. And um, so if I hide this layer and I go back to the shadow, I'm thinking about that here. So I know this is a shape that's bulging out, but I know in here it's going back in. So I'm going to add shadow there. I'm going to add my gray tone back. And let's see. I'm not sure why I'm not seeing a mark right now. Oh, I'm, I think I was on the eraser. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, adding more shadow to that area. And then here I see there's another shadow like this, and then there's a little bit of reflected shadow. Again, always trying to apply what you learned from your sphere shading assignment in class to every single form that exists on the face. Um, and then go here. I see that there's a shadow here. And then this comes to highlight and then it goes back in again, this lovely curve of flesh that just wraps around and forms the eyelid here. I really want to show that. And I'm just letting the color of the gray tone kind of create that the illusion of that highlight for me. And uh, even though I'm using an airbrush, I will definitely plan to come back and have some hard edges. I'm um, going to talk about that a little bit later. That's very, very key to having a realistic painting because you don't want everything to just look super smooth. Um, adding a lot more shadow to her eyelid and her eyelashes. I just shrink the brush and uh, go into a heavier pressure when I want everything to look darker. Again, I'm never really changing the color of my brush here. And so when I get into the nose, um, one thing that I see a lot of people do with the nose is they'll render the nostril this entire black shape and it looks like a hole on the face. And that's not what you want to do. You want a very tiny point to be black. This point right here is the darkest area. But as soon as you come out, there's skin that's coming closer and closer and closer and closer to being outside of this little cave and so it's going to get lighter and lighter and lighter and so you want that gradation to be evident there and uh, another tip about drawing is whatever you're drawing whatever you're painting you want your brush to be bigger than that 
um, that tends to give you the right mindset when it comes to painting. And it gives you this really nice uh, controlled look to everything. Over here, I'm adding in this little dip in her nose. I really need to learn the names of these parts of the face more. <laughs> I know somewhere here is like the Cupid's bow, like this thing right here, but not this part. I think it's like the philtrum or something. Um, usually when I'm doing characters, I'll also have like a very stark lighting like this and have a shadow here, but I'll try to stick to the reference like that. And you see here, she has kind of a sharp transition here for the nose, so I'm gonna add that in. Like that, it's very soft. Add a little bit of a shadow here, wraps around the curve of that nose there. And here, I'm gonna actually go ahead and take the eraser and lighten up this part of the nose. Like that. Come back with the airbrush. And you can see here, since the light is hitting from this side, the shadows on this end. So I'm going to add a pretty decent amount of shadow here. Add a little bit of shadow again to round out her nose right there. And I'm going to zoom out, and I feel like I was close. I feel like I'm close to getting a little bit too dark with the nose, but I think I'm, I'm going to be fine for now as long as I make sure to complement it with the rest of the face. And uh, now we're going to get into the lips. With the lips, um, aesthetically, what I like to do is since there's a the darkest part of the lips is going to be the crease in between, I'm going to go ahead and start there and add a shadow there that kind of radiates outwards. Then I'm going to come back in, and like I said, with the the kind of corners of the mouth are like little dimples. I'm going to shade those areas. I shaded them already, the darkest parts, with my pencil, and I'm just going to add a little bit more with my airbrush here. Add a little bit more shadow to the top lip. That tends to be darker than the bottom lip because the bottom lip is usually uh, more volumetric and it captures more light. Then I'm going to add some shadow to the very bottom of her lip and let that highlight kind of show itself there. The lip is going to cast some shadow here. Again, remembering our flow chart here, seeing how that form goes around, especially on this guy's face. You can see how it moves around, and that's going to be a very uh, dark area when we're considering a light source that we do for this reference. So you can see here, this is already looking very realistic. Um, there is definitely a lot of artists and a lot of different styles where they'll just go into finishing out the rendering for the features and they won't add any rendering for the face. Um, but what I like to do is just add a very subtle hint to it um, after I'm done rendering the features. And so for the chin, you see there's a shadow there. It's gonna add a little bit of that shadow. Just to really show, you know, this is just pleasing to the eye when you understand these forms. Um, and you can be able to convey them with your, your shading. And for the neck, you can see it's very dark here. Um, you can see the musculature and the anatomy of the neck makes this kind of sharp edge right here where the transition of the uh, value is much darker. So I'm going to try to represent that here. A lot of artists will also do a technique where they'll use the lasso tool, which is also very good. But um, I tend not to use it. It's a little bit too harsh for me. One day I'll either try to... F I, I'll either, if I really need to, I'll take the time to feather my, my selection, or I'll just wait for one day when there's like a default feathered selection tool out there. Try to add that shadow in. It's one of the darkest shadows in the portrait, so I'm going to really try to make this darker. This is another reason I love working with uh, 
programs on my computer um, rather than something like an iPad because there's a lot more forgiveness when it comes to blending out these values. Sometimes, you know, you'll use a smaller brush and you might make a mistake to do something like that. And it kind of shows the shape of the brush, but it's very easy to kind of work with that and blend it out, um, especially in Clip Studio where there's a lot of uh, really, really great intuitive blending tools available. But speaking of blending tools, I don't, I try not to use them as much. I use the technique, like I mentioned before, where I prefer to have the brush bigger than what I'm doing. And when you're patient with that, you tend, to, you can almost get to the point where you never need to blend because everything already looks good. Just adding some more shadow to their hair. I'm thinking about, okay, where are my darkest shadows? Where are my lightest shadows here? Since I added such a dark one, over there, I'm trying to compensate for that. Um, what I think I'm going to do now is actually I'm going to go ahead and add the light shadows to show the rest of the form of her face. So I'm going to go in here, make my brush pretty big, and I'm just going to show the form of her face. So I want this plain, this round, soft form here to kind of show that it's darker. So if I were to just really try to show you what I'm thinking about, I'm thinking like that. Um, and then I'm thinking here so this is going to be where the highlight is and then this is going to be a little bit darker than that area or a little bit lighter than this area so i'm going to shade in that area as well and then this area is going to be light because that's where the um, light source is hitting but you know again the corner of the nose where the highlight is is going to be the brightest part and then the top of the nose is going to be a little bit darker than this side So you can see all those things I said, when I actually start doing them, it's extremely subtle. But it's very important. Again, I'm just letting the pressure sensitivity of the pencil, of the pen, um, actually do the work for me when it comes to getting these values in. And I hope you're already noticing that how much this is already starting to do for us, even though we aren't having any lighting yet. Um, and if you notice here, there's a nice, beautiful rim light here. So I'm going to softly shade in the, the core shadow, I believe. That's right before it. There. So for me, this part of the painting process is just the most relaxing and the fun part because it really does come naturally if you really spend your time while planning the image, making sure um, the aesthetics are there, the flow is there. Because um, once all that stuff is there, it becomes really easy to understand where you should be shading. So I'm starting to shade and show the curve and the uh, roundness of the forehead here. Remember, this is the part of the head that's most like a sphere. So we really want to show that, that curve. I'm also always looking at this area right here. I love this part, the navigator. Um, you always want to be keeping your artwork looking great in the navigator image and keep it fairly small. If it looks bad in the navigator image, it probably is starting to look bad overall. So always be keeping an eye on that. I'm noticing this area could be a little bit darker. The whole neck should be darker than her face. And then I see this area is in shadow compared to the side of her, her upper lip. So I'm going to lightly shade that as well. Josh, do you want to keep drawing and we just answer some questions? Yeah, that's great. OK. All right. Um, we. we we will start with a very common one. Could you explain your equipment again, what you're using okay. for drawing? Sure. So right now I'm using a Cintiq Pro 32-inch, uh, a Wacom Cintiq Pro, um, and I'm just using the regular uh, Pro pen that comes with it. And mm -hmm. I also have a, I'm, have the Ergo stand as well. Um, mm -hmm. And then I'm working in Clip Studio Paint Pro, and 
yeah, that's that's about it for the tools that I'm using. Yeah, nothing particular about your PC or anything. Oh Just yeah, my it. PC. So um, uh, my PC is quite a bit overkill because I do a lot of other content creation. But um, mm -hmm. my PC, I have a 2080 Ti um, and a 9900K, so that's a eight core processor, um, and I have 64 gigs of RAM. Um, but you know, you should. I recommend like about a quarter of everything I mentioned. Like you don't have to get that much power just to paint. Um, but again, yeah, it's it's kind of overkill because I do like if I want to film this in 4K and you know stream it at the same time, I want everything to be you know smooth. Yeah. <laughs> um, how long have you been drawing? So I've been drawing. Uh, let me actually pull up my. Instagram. So I've been drawing my whole life, but I've been doing very, very detailed pencil portraits. Like, um, imagine like uh, this portrait right here, but render it out completely like your typical traditional pencil drawing. But I do like maybe five of those a year or so. So I only did like 35 of those between when I got serious at drawing at 11 and then when I stopped doing that around uh, age 19. And then I took a break from art, pretty much just doing random stuff and digital art. I really wasn't trying to learn. Um, and then I started to focus on learning here in 2017. Um, and so that's where I like to say I've, I've really been focused on growing. So this is 2017, and then that's where I'm at now. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, the, I will say, you know, doing the grid method, the drawing of those really nice pencil portraits with pencil on paper really does help you pay attention to detail. Um, yeah. Yeah. How did you get into digital art? Do you just stumble into it? <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't, I, it's, it's funny cause it's like, it all kind of happened so fast. It's when I got into college and, uh, I just, I guess I was just starting to be exposed. I like one thing I like to tell people is I didn't really know the word anime until I was in college. Um, even though I watched some stuff on like, uh, Adult Swim and like Cartoon Network and Toonami. I didn't really understand it was anime. And so when I got into college, I started to see this type of artwork that was really cool. So I got my, you know, my $80 Wacom tablet for my birthday and I, I really loved it. Hmm. And then um, just, you just tried out software, just checking online. Yes, I, I spent too much time and failed a few classes because I was downloading softwares left and right. I remember one of my most beloved experiences with Clip Studio <laughs> was when I got a screenshot from Attack on Titan and I was tracing over it and just trying to figure out how to work with Clip Studio and try to make it look like a like a comic, like a manga page mm. illustration. <laughs> um, but yeah, I was just trying all kinds of stuff. So, so anime had s some influence. Do you have any other influence that was really important for your art? I had, you know, I, I felt like I, I'm a very weird case where I had to like find my own influence when I got older. I mm. didn't, I really wasn't too inspired by, I didn't have really the opportunity to be very inspired by uh, art that exists that already existed when I was growing up. I was doing a lot of just, you know, really traditional pencil portraits. Like that's really what all I was doing. I didn't really have this identity of creativity growing up. Um, mm. So yeah, it's, it's now I just have artists that I like and anime as well. <laughs> okay, uh, let's get a little more into the technical side of things. Um, how long does it usually an artwork, artwork take you? So that can vary on how difficult it is. So like a piece like this, um, it would take me, let's say four hours to get to the place where I have my lighting in. And then I'd say 48 hours for a piece like this where I have a little bit more and I would actually draw, you know, more of what you see in the image. Um, but some pieces can go crazy like this one here. This one took me 50 hours because of the, the wow. detail that I had in it. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I was just going through ideas, so many ideas. You can see, like, how the sketch started here. Mm -hmm. um, just an incredible amount of ideas going through. 
Um, and then some things will take me uh, maybe 10 to 12 hours just because I'm watching tutorials and trying to learn and improve as I do things. But on yeah. average, I'd say four to eight hours is, okay. is how long things take me. Yeah, yeah. Um, as a content creator, do you feel the need to produce content really fast? And do you have any tips on working faster? Yeah, um, it's, I found the best thing is to try to have quality, put out your best stuff more than do things often. But when it comes to doing things often, you don't always have to do a lot of work. It could be showing your process. It could be showing um, tutorials. It could be showing what you're studying at the moment. It doesn't always have to be artwork that you're sharing when it comes to content. But yeah, I do feel a little bit of a pressure to be faster. Um, but I found that if I start to suffer a slack on quality, that will hurt way more than being slow when it comes to or having less content. Yeah. Okay. Um, what are your your tools you're using in general for shadows, sketches, line art, color? Um, so when it comes to like when I'm sketching, I just have like a brush that's very soft, like this soft brush or my custom brushes that I make in Procreate. Um, when it comes to line art, I do like to have a little bit of a grit to my work. So um, I have this, I have a modified version of the design pencil that comes in default. And this is what I like to do for like um, this piece. So when I, this is kind of the sketch and when I want to refine it, I'm going to take this one. Um, and you can see how this is just going to have a much more impactful look if I zoom into how that looks there. Mm. Um, and ideally that's what I would have done for this piece as well, but it's it was a lot of learning, so I just had to draw over it. Um, but you'll see there's some grit to the line work there. Some areas like this is where I like to have that. Um, and then for coloring, I'm still very, I consider myself like a novice when it comes to color. I just like to do flats and then I will um, add some kind of some accent colors like the blush in her lips and then certain areas on her joints. And mm -hmm. then I'll try to have a highlight layer and then I'll use multiply layers of grays to show the shadows. I'm a very, it's a very um, kind of, it's actually like if you were to, if I were to do anime art, like the professional stuff where they show a lot more detail, that's how I like to do a lot of my coloring. Um, but you mm -hmm. can see here, this is where I'm, really struggling and trying to push myself and so this piece is is going to be a while <laughs> before i finish <laughs> okay um could you share the the anatomy references once again yes i was i was thinking i should have uh, <laughs> found a way to so this is on cubebrush uh, dot co um this guy's name is murray i actually don't know who it is exactly, but they have this really cool free con this like 24 pages of the fundamental series form lighting. Um, he has a Riley head 3D model. You don't even have to down like if you have a 3D modeling software, you can download this in. That's great. But you can just look at it here. Um, and it's free and you can just have it for reference. And then on ArtStation, if you find William Wynn here, he has this amazing reference that you can actually move around and change the lighting of, uh, I can't remember the name of this head. It's, it's a specific name, it's a very famous diagram of, actually his is a little bit different, but yeah, this is really great stuff to look at. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, the Loomis method and all that, good too. Yeah. And I think you also had like one with the actual bone structure. Oh yes, yeah. so this thing um, is actually like a professional, like it's called Muscle Premium. Mm -hmm. This is like a professional software for studying the entire body um, and the anatomy of it. It's it's pretty expensive. I think it's like $60, but for oh, me, yeah. it's like so worth it um, because I can just have different parts and study those parts mm -hmm. that I need to because I'm, I'm planning. I'm in a head course right now, so I'm actually studying what I'm teaching <laughs> just because I want to <laughs> make my own course and make sure I don't forget anything. And eventually I'm gonna take another course on the body. And so having this reference is just perfect for me. Um, 
but yeah, definitely recommend this because you know it's 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 one I I find like it's just better than having the real skull here for me and my uses because I can just have it there, leave it off to the side, and work from it. Is that is that an art app or is it like an an it's actually, app no, for yeah, doctors? It's literally, it's probably for doctors. Like, yeah, I think it is. <laughs> I'm gonna search it up. They have different. They actually have like ones that have quizzes for you. Um, oh wow! So <laughs> yeah, I think you could set up a quiz for something, and you can like draw and annotate on it. So yeah, I think oh, it's wow. definitely it's overkill, but I really like it. <laughs> okay. Um. How how do you use um layers usually? Do you have set structure or does it depend on the work? So for layers, yeah, I do um tend to have a set structure for them. Uh so for this kind of piece, it's usually I'll have the sketch and then I'll have the shadows and the lights. And then the shadows and the lights will be under the sketch and then eventually I'll merge them. However, in more complex pieces like uh the confusion piece right here. I'll subdivide, so I'll have the sketch, I'll have the shadows and the layers, but all of those will be in their own groups for our mm -hmm. foreground, midground, background. And so the background will have a shadow light layer, foreground will have a shadow light layer, midground will have a shadow light layer, mm -hmm. and then all of those will have their own respective color layers. And so that's usually when I can't work in a mobile platform anymore. I have to come to mm -hmm. um, Clip Studio Pro or Photoshop or something because I need to have a lot of layers. Um, that's just me. Um, you know, painting is is something that I understand in a very systematic way. So, um, mm -hmm. but I'm always I find that you know merging and progressively merging and creating backup files rather than backup layers is really the best way for me to go. Yeah. Because um, sometimes you just have to commit to move forward. Yeah, I see your your canvas size is also massive. Do you have like yes. a standard you go to? Um, right now my standard is six thousand by six thousand, or sometimes I go to eight thousand. Um, it's just because I have a painting. Um, I right now the biggest demand I have is if I want to print on a large metal print, uh, mm -hmm. the canvas size goes above five thousand. So I'm just like I'm gonna go another thousand just to make sure. Hmm. Um, and I find that the bigger the image, like I don't really have to worry about increasing the size anymore because the bigger the image, um, it tends to, you can blow it up more and you don't see much of a problem. Whereas if you blow up a uh, 2000 by 2000 pixel canvas and try to bring it up to 4,900 something that they require, it's really yeah. going to be noticeable. Wow. Um, so we got the questions like, do you finish most of the things in Clip Studio or do you switch between apps? Um, Clips, I almost always finish everything in Clip Studio. I actually, like now, sometimes I'll draw something in Clip Studio just because I feel so much freer when I'm sketching. And then mm. if I want to work on using some brushes specifically for Procreate, then I'll bring it to Procreate. Um, it's It's funny, like, because usually you would think, okay, do it first in the smaller program and then bring it to a more professional one. But sometimes I'll go back and forth. Um, yeah. Yeah, but I find, yeah, working in Clip Studio for the initial phase and the ending is really great. And then photo, usually Photoshop is where everything ends. I'm just so used to editing images in Photoshop. Mm. Okay. <laughs> um, how do you keep your characters and your faces recognizable? What do you really need to stand out to make it essentially look like the the face you want it to look? So one thing that uh, I mentioned is the keystone. Um, I learned that this is really a key part in how the person looks because it does, you know, relate to the femininity and the masculinity of the person. But some people have wider keystones. Some people have smaller. Some people have eyes that are farther apart, some people's are smaller. Um, but I think just getting a good understanding of, of shape language overall is going to help your characters really stand out. Um, a lot of design principles also apply when you're drawing characters. So like, you know, the big, medium, small, I recommend looking mm -hmm. up a video by Cynics on YouTube for that. Um, paying attention to what's on the face that's recognizable, having clear shapes. Um, a lot of ovals are in this uh, character's face, but there is also a lot of triangles here. 
Um, that can also be related to your style as well. Um, you can also have a concentrated amount of values depending on your style. And that can also vary from character to character. Um, it's just having bold statements in some way is a really great way to have your stuff recognizable. Okay, wonderful. Um, yeah, I think if you want to add like one final tip that would just help every artist to finish this whole session, that'd be great. <laughs> okay, um, so the final tip I can give you is just, uh, for me, it's, oh, it's definitely okay to be very frustrated and upset with your progress. It can feel like you're not moving forward. Like literally, I am not kidding you. The other day I was like, should I keep doing this? Like, this is oh. really bad. <laughs> like, <laughs> trust me, that's going to happen a lot. Um, and you have to be, try to be in a place where you're relaxed when you're drawing and be in this, like, it sounds weird, but try to be like in this meditative zen out mode where you don't even care about the result. And it's just about continuing the process and you're going to find that you grow so fast doing that and your work is going to be so much better when you're relaxed like that's why everyone draws amazing stuff in math class but when they're in art <laughs> class you know it looks terrible because they don't care in math so they're just <laughs> having fun um so and combine that with getting a lot of work done so instead of frustrating yourself trying to get something really amazing done try to relax get a lot of stuff done um draw as much as you can not with any intention, and you're going to find you're going to grow really fast. That is a great note to end this on. Thank you so much. That's all the questions we have for today. Okay. That's awesome. I am so happy to have done this. Um, well, thank you so much, Joanna, and thank you so much, Josh, uh, for the amazing presentation, and also for all of you who are still with us. Um, and... Um, Yes, this presentation has been so great. I'm pretty sure we have learned a lot. And also we, we would like to, to follow us and also for more information and, and learn more about Cliff Studio Paint, please visit our website, cliffstudio.net forward slash n in graphicsly.com. And just remember you guys that this webinar is being recorded and it will be shared in our YouTube channel of Celsius Web and also on Graphicsly. And of course, for more information about Ergo Josh, uh, follow, follow him on his social media, Instagram, uh, especially on his YouTube channel and on his website. And so again, thank you, Joanna. Thank you, Josh. It was a pleasure. Love this. Thank you. Guys. <laughs> Have a great time drawing. <laughs> All right, thank you and, so much. Yeah, thank you both. Uh, thank you for the people who are still with us. And remember to follow us and stay tuned for more, more webinars and more information about Clip City Pain. Thank you so much and see you on our next webinar. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.